Good morning and welcome to the second webinar today. Uh, my name is Danny and I'm with the learning team at Cherry Beckert. Just want to go over a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. For audio during today's webinar, you may listen through the phone or the computer speakers. You can choose your audio under the audio tab in the menu to the right of your screen. To earn CPE for today's webinar, please make sure you answer all the polling questions. Make sure you click the submit button to submit your answer. Instructors will try to remind you of this as each poll appears. We will be distributing CPE certificates via email in the coming weeks. The instructors and I will answer questions in the question and answer pod. We will try to answer them throughout the webinar. We also would like to have webcams up, but unfortunately we're running into a technical issue on the GoToWebinar test uh, new platform. Uh, so please bear with us as we try to work that out. Um, so currently you should not really be seeing anything um, at the moment. If we can get them up and running, um, then we'll have um, our panelists to show at that point. But I will go ahead and turn it over to Matthew. Well, thank you, Danny. Appreciate it. And again, apologies to everyone that you are unable to see us for this panel style discussion session. Uh, we had webcam, we did a test of this and we had all webcams working. And when we logged in, none of our webcams uh, are being able to be shared. So we're going to blame it on the technology platform and not on us since we all know what we're doing. Um, but really appreciate everyone uh, joining us. I am very excited about this session. This is a little change up from the lecture style session we had this morning on technology and some of the sessions we have this afternoon. Um, so this session will be uh, a discussion among not-for-profit leaders on sort of lessons learned from the pandemic and we'll go through a variety of, of subject area. We'll have some poll questions for you guys to answer to give us some, some context on how your organizations have dealt with and responded to the pandemic. And, uh, and then we'll ask our panelists uh, some questions about, you know, what's going on with their organization. So uh, to start off, I'd just like to introduce all of our panelists this morning. Uh, first of all, we have Alyssa Federico. Uh, Alyssa is the Senior Vice President of Finance at Foundation for the Carolinas, where she serves as the foundation's financial point of contact for client relationships and all other matters of accounting related issues. She manages the daily activities of the finance team for the foundation and is responsible for overseeing internal controls for the foundation as well. Alyssa has over 22 years of experience in not-for-profit accounting, auditing, operational issues, and she also serves in a variety of board member and committee roles and is currently the chair of the board of the Finance Administration and Operations Group which is a national network of community foundation, finance, administrative, and investment executives. She also holds various other positions with CF Insights, which is a national data collective for community foundations, Second Harvest Food Bank of the Metrolina, Charlotte Works, the AICPA's Not-for-Profit Advisory Council, and last but not least, the FASB's Not-for-Profit Advisory Committee. She also serves as my personal uh, advisor on all things Disney World when I'm making plans uh, to visit with my family. She knows pretty much everything there is to, to know about uh, strategy uh, to, to visit Disney World. So, Alyssa, it's great to have you on, even if it's by audio only. Happy to be here. Great. We also have Kristen McCullum with us. Kristen is the Chief Financial Officer of United Way of Greater Atlanta since January of 2017. Prior to that role, she served as the controller at the United Way for 14 years, and she oversees the management of uh, finance operations, HR, donor services operations, and the Gift in Kinds program for one of the largest United Ways in America. She also manages the Finance and Property Committee, the Audit Committee, the Compensation Committee, and Investment Subcommittee, which are all comprised of key volunteer leaders. She's actively involved in the development of financial standards and guidelines for the United Way at a national level, and has co-authored several guidelines, including accounting for gift and kind transactions, fiscal sponsorship, and reserves and reserves policies. 
Uh, before United Way of Greater Atlanta, she was uh, spent five years with Ernst & Young in Atlanta in their assurance and advisory services, focusing on not-for-profit organizations. So Kristen, we welcome you as well, and thank you for, for being with us. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, glad to be here. And I'm sorry we can't uh, show video because I have my children's artwork in my background uh, since we're all still remote, uh, but happy to be here. I hear you. I've got a fake plant that I strategically positioned right behind me to make my background look really good, too. Um, and lastly, we have uh, Phyllis Palmero. Phyllis is the chief financial officer and chief operating officer at the Collegiate School in Richmond, Virginia. In her role, Phyllis is responsible for the school's budget and finance management, investments, business services, facilities management, HR, construction, campus safety, IT, and auxiliary services. And prior to her work at Collegiate, she spent three years as the director for the Institute for Effective Governance in Washington, D.C., where she worked with college and university trustees on governance issues in the higher education sector. She also spent five years as the executive director of the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia, which is the coordinating body for the Virginia Higher Education, where she provided financial and policy leadership as well. And among other positions, Phyllis serves as the board, on the board of directors of the Independent School Data Exchange or INDEX, and she's an active member of the Virginia Association of Independent Schools, serving on their financial officers group and advocacy committees. And she's an active member of the National Business Officers Association, having served on their annual meeting program advisory committee, and also as a faculty member for their Business Officers Institute. Phyllis, welcome to you as well, and thanks for being here. Thank you, look forward to today's meeting. Great, well, um, you guys have more impressive resumes than I do. Let me just start with that. Mine's, mine's uh, half, half the length. I feel like I haven't accomplished much yet in my career. Um, but it's great to be joined by three people that provide a lot of different you know, perspectives from different types of not-for-profit organizations. So if we could just start maybe in that same order, and uh, Alyssa, could you tell us a little bit more about Foundation for the Carolinas for those that aren't familiar? Sure. Um, foundation for the Carolinas is a community foundation based in Charlotte, North Carolina. It serves a 13-county region. Um, we are the sixth largest community foundation in the United States um, with assets of $2.5 billion. Um, and we manage endowments, donor advised funds, uh, various uh, agency funds to, to help support the investment activity of local nonprofits. Um, as well as some other uh, lines of scholarships, employee relief, et cetera. Thank you. And Kristen, uh, I think everybody knows you know, what the United Way is, uh, probably one of the most nationally and internationally recognized uh, organizations, but do you wanna provide a little bit more context on United Way of sure. Greater Atlanta? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, as most of you, uh, may know or, or may not, um, each United Way uh, in the Americas and internationally, we are um, all independent 501c3 organizations with United Way Worldwide as kind of the, you know, parent body, if you will, but we are independent. Branding comes from United Way Worldwide um, and some trainings and learnings and such and uh, platform related issues. Um, but we do all stand alone. Uh, the United Way in Atlanta is the largest United Way uh, in the nation in, in terms of uh, gross revenue um, in fiscal year uh, 2020, which ended for a June 30 fiscal year end. Our uh, total revenue raise was 144 million. That was the highest ever uh, in our history. Uh, it was the highest ever uh, for you know, a couple reasons. One main reason being um, the COVID uh, pandemic and our launch with the Community Foundation of Greater Atlanta of the COVID-19 Response and Recovery Fund, which in and of itself raised $33 million uh, collectively between both organizations. Um, we do, um, we are unique as a nonprofit. We um, own our building. We own um, our, a conference center. It's a, a day conference center for uh, meeting space for primarily nonprofits, but some for profits. We own our parking deck and we own a surface lot so we own uh, most of, a, of, of one full block in downtown Atlanta and are grateful to have our own space, although we haven't really been there uh, since March. Um, 
we historically have have had a gifts in kind program in a warehouse um, where we uh, take in goods from uh, you know Staples, Home Depot, um, et cetera, and then and give them back out to to other nonprofits in the community where there is a need. Um, but due to downsizing, uh, we have uh, we are no longer uh, in a in a warehouse for our gifts in kind program. Uh, we still do have a program, but just not at the same expense level. Um, so you know, I've been with the organization a long time. Uh, we really do great work. We focus on child well-being specifically in the 13 county uh, metro Atlanta region. And uh, we believe that if the children are well, then all is well. If the children are not, then families and individuals are not well either. Um, so our focus primarily is on children and child well-being. Thank you, Kristen. Appreciate it. Sure. Appreciate your, your insights. How about you, Phyllis? Hi, we're um, Collegiate School is a um, independent school, JK through 12 co-ed day school. We have currently this year 1,696 kids, almost 1,700 students in person every day, at least through now, and uh, look forward to uh, talking about some of the things we've learned during the pandemic. Thank you. So uh, appreciate everybody uh, and your insights. I guess I'm organized today around a few different topic areas that I thought we could focus on. Uh, the first kind of being the issue of, of people and culture and just how this pandemic uh, has impacted us. You know, I think one of the most significant impacts that the pandemic has had uh, is on our people, <laughs> on our employees and our staff, our volunteers. You know, many not-for-profits were forced to make some rather difficult decisions when it came to staffing. Um, and the demand for services for, from all of us has, has generally increased during this time as well. So simply put, you know, not-for-profits are having to do more with less right now. And it's put a lot of stress on staff, on volunteers, you know, who've had to rapidly uh, adapt to the continuing changing, you know, work environment and how to deliver programs and services. So as we go into this topic, I'd like uh, to launch our first polling question. And Danny, if you could launch that for us. And we just want to know for your organization, how has the pandemic impacted your people and culture over the last nine months? Um, are you feeling like it has had an overall negative impact? Has it had an overall positive impact? Um, zero impact? I, I doubt we'll see a, a ton of those, but maybe. Maybe uh, it just really hasn't impacted you. Or maybe it's been a mix of both, um, which I assume will get probably a lot more in that category since good things are happening and, and difficult things are happening as well. So uh, we've got about 88% of the vote in. Again, this is the first of four polling questions. You need to answer at least three of them. So if you get in this one now, uh, that'll help make sure that you get CPE credit for this session. And as we're about, you know, 92% of the vote is in so far, we're just going to wait a couple more seconds, give you a chance to answer this. And, um, well, Danny is closing that out. Um, surprising, uh, we'll take a look at the results here. I don't think it's a ton uh, that's surprising, but the, the vast majority of people, all but 7%, so 93% either said, Overall, this has kind of been a negative impact to the organization. Um, and for most of those out there, almost 70% mix of positive and negative things. So um, interested to hear from our panelists. And maybe, you know, Phyllis, since you're in the education space and uh, <laughs> you have no choice but to continue uh, delivering your services uh, to students and parents, I, I might start with you and just how has the pandemic imp impacted you know, your people and culture, and how, how have you been able to respond and adapt? Yeah, so um, independent schools uh, nationally have had um, different experiences depending on where they are regionally. In the Richmond um, area, and particularly in the South, I would say, we have made a call to make sure we uh, deliver our education um, in person to the extent it's safe to do so. Um, we were uh, closed by the governor early in February, um, actually mid-February, so we went immediately remote. Um, and so pivoting um, 1,700 kids to remote education was not an easy challenge, 
but we did it. We did it well. And um, with every challenge, it was certainly opportunity. I think our teachers had um, invested a lot of time this summer to perfect their online uh, teaching. And, um, and we were able to get out equipment and, and do a better job um, through, through those months. But we knew coming in uh, to the extent we were gonna be uh, allowed to open in person that that is what our families wanted. Um, so even though there are about 150,000 students in the Richmond, central Richmond area who are learning remotely, um, I'm pleased to say we are delivering an in-person education, including all aspects, sports, theater, the arts. Now, some have been reimagined in different ways, like our play was an online play, even though they did it in person on stage. A lot of creativity went into that. So, um, so we've been able to deliver our product, and we're also ready to go remote at any time should we have a need to, whether it's a need within our community because of the um, outbreak that might be local or whether it's uh, dictated by uh, government action. Um, but thankfully, um, as of now, we've been fully in person. The culture, we are definitely an employee teacher centric um, institution. That's what our product is, is that our teachers do a great job. So of course, returning with um, 1,700 asymptomatic children was a big challenge for us. We needed to make sure our teachers were safe. So while nationally teacher unions were protesting a return to school with students, um, and in many cases that is what prevailed, we were fortunate enough to, um, to be able to have our teachers in person. But we needed to make sure they felt safe. Um, and we spent an inordinate amount of money, over $2 million to get our campus ready including many, many um, increases to our HVAC, filtration, um, UV lights, um, cleaning protocols, um, technology investments, um, density control. We reduced class sizes to make sure that we didn't have too many kids in a class, spread out all over campus, put out outdoor tents, like many of our independent school counterparts have done. And that um, showed a great deal of care to our faculty and staff and um, we have protocols in and we're very conservative in our contact tracing so we don't let kids in even if they're not positive or have only been exposed so a big part of our, um, our initiative and our success has to do with care for our students but care for our faculty and staff as well and i think that is what's been successful for us and uh there there was also a great deal of transparency in what we're doing where we um needed to improve where things could be better and that transparency has to happen to build that trust. So um, I think, you know, no matter what your culture in your organization, building trust to all of us saying that this is all new for us and we know it's hard. This has been amazingly hard for our faculty and staff, particularly the teachers in the classroom. And so we've given days off, extra days to recuperate, to rebuild um, energy. This is sucks everything out of you as a teacher in a classroom with you know 15 to 20 kids every day. Yeah. Um, it's just it's difficult. So um, you know people and culture are what we are as institutions of education, and so we have to take care of our folks and make sure they feel confident and safe, and that's what we've done. I'm curious, Phyllis, with the with the way you um, responded, did you end up? Uh, sort of minimizing some of the turnover at the faculty and staff level or do people you know overall feel like the changes you put in place and the precautions you took made them feel safe enough to to return to teaching yeah well actually we did and you know our own data suggests the kids are not getting sick at school um i know we're hearing that nationally there are different reports about that uh, that doesn't mean what people are doing outside of school isn't being brought into school, but there is no case to date that we can trace back to anything at school. So um, our goal is to make sure that we're being really open and honest with our community, that they own a lot of responsibility to keep our faculty and staff safe too. But um, as you go each week and you know we're at week, I think it's, oh, I don't even remember anymore. I think we're in the 20s now. Um, with no cases and transmissions happening from school, you can build that confidence. Now, of course, you know, the community and our nation as a whole is seeing more and more cases. So people are getting more and more nervous. So the holiday break is coming at a very good time. And we have decided to go an extra week so that people can quarantine before return. 
So we, you know, we we do, we meet weekly and make changes and fine tune, but our, I think we have a community of trust and we have not seen a lot of transition. There are people who have health issues who have decided to go on FMLA and wait it out, um, but that, that very few, very few. We are yeah. basically full, full in and have more people than we've ever had working to make sure we can deliver a product product that's of great quality. So, yeah. Great. Maybe we'll turn to another one of our panelists and and kind of ask similar questions. Just the toll this has taken on on the organization and the people. And and maybe Alyssa, is there anything? You know, hindsight being 2020, anything that you wish you would have had in place for your your people or your organization to respond to this pandemic uh, and, and the toll it's taken on sort of the human capital? How, how's, how's things been going at Foundation for the Carolinas? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, we, we have gone from a, a very high year of grants at 28,000 in 2017, thinking that was just astronomical for us to this year passing 120,000 grants. So we've certainly had, um, you know, overtime and lots of hours and um, transactional activity that is just, um, you know, overwhelming at, at points of time. And so I, you know, in hindsight, I wish there were a few things that were in place that might um, automate a few things better. Um, we certainly have, have a lot of automation put into our system, but for example, the mail coming in the door and sorting through checks. Um, for the longest time, we have said we don't have the volume that um, warrants the cost um, benefit ratio of a of a lockbox. Um, but boy, wouldn't that have been nice in this situation, um, even if it costs us a little more. Um, another thing is uh, electronic signatures. With us all being remote um, and not having uh, a real formal policy or procedure for how we sign documents um, and we're heavily document driven um, from the legal side to fund agreements, et cetera. Um, that would have been nice to have in place as well. I think it would have uh, aided in letting people not worry about how they were going to get documents to and from. Um, and then, you know, as we, as we work through, um, uh, we, I think we all have kind of disaster recovery plans internally, um, but I don't think any of them probably contemplated this. <laughs> and so um, probably a, a more thorough look at how we would shift work around and how that might be impacted. I certainly think it's something we will take a look at after the fact. Um, but, you know, for example, if we're trying to minimize people coming into the office for any reason, how are we shifting work that's fair um, to minimize the number of people in, but still get the work done. So. Great. Great. Yeah. It's easy to see those disaster recovery plans as a, as a checkbox on your 990. Do we have one? Oh yeah. We've got yep. <laughs> but, but when you have to dust it off and, and put it into place, that's a whole different story. Um, Kristen, yeah. I want to give you a chance uh, as well. And, and maybe, you know, <laughs> what have you guys done? Have you done anything to help manage anxiety and stress among people or how are you guys handling things? Yeah, um, thanks, Matthew. So I would say there's, you know, maybe you know a handful of things that we have done that I could point to that I think have been very helpful. So, you know, number one, I, I think our greatest thing was communicate. Just communicate, communicate, communicate with our employees as to what is going on. You know, in HR and in finance, um, I, you know, personally know what our COVID plan is from day to day, but I do realize that the rest of the organization is not privy to that inside knowledge. So we tried to communicate as much as possible. Um, so specifically uh, around employee engagement from March 16th, which is when we all went virtual, through the end of June, HR sent out a daily email to all staff. Um, some, of, some of what we sent out in terms of content was, you know, lighter, you know, a little more fun. Um, you know, for example, what to do with your, you know, kids while they're home during, you know, the quarantine. Um, other others, other emails were more information driven about, you know, the latest COVID-19 updates and what the CDC is recommending and so on. So, but we wanted employees to know that they could count on HR every day to send something out that would be applicable to them. And I think that especially for, you know, we, we think about those with families and kids at home, you know, during that, you know, initial part of COVID, but the people that are single, 
who other single that are in their apartment uh, during the shelter at home time that really had nowhere to go and no human contact other than uh, virtual meetings. So we thought it was very important to uh, reach out to staff on a daily basis. And we did that through June. And then since June, you know, it's, it's been a little more sporadic um, in terms of the official kind of HR updates. Um, but we also in November did a 30 day gratitude challenge. And so every day in November for the 30 days, HR sent out a kind of daily gratitude email. And you really would be amazed at how much, um, you know, people are really appreciated those emails. And it was a simple, you know, saying that, you know, we, we took the 30 day gratitude from another website um, and then did it, did it every day for 30 days. And, and people loved it. People love the, the upbeatness, the positivity. And they just really appreciated it. Um, so kind of that's what we did, uh, you know, specifically around employee engagement um, to help manage anxiety and stress. Um, another thing we, we implemented probably early April was we banned all internal meetings between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. because people people were burning out. Um, you know, you're you're meeting after meeting after meeting, internal or external, um, and and you're you know skipping. You know, found that employees were eating lunch at their makeshift desk, you know, on their kitchen, wh wh wherever they were working, in their in their TV room. Um, so we wanted to recognize that employees really do need a break. And so we, we mandated no internal meetings during the, that two hour period and encourage staff to, you know, take a, take a break, go eat lunch. If you have kids at home, you're gonna have to feed your kids. It's okay, don't feel like you have to accept a meeting invite during that time frame. So that has really helped. We, we're continuing to do that um, to, to, the, to the best of our abilities. And then the third thing we started implementing, you know, probably April-ish, um, we implemented what's called Flexible Fridays. And we're, we're, we still have that now. And again, we were recognizing that people were working honestly more than they were when they were in the office because they're not commuting. So you're starting your day earlier, you're ending it later because you're not getting in the car. And in Atlanta, that's a big deal. Your commute, um, you know, my commute is like an hour and 15 minutes plus one way. And so I all of a sudden had, you know, more time, didn't have to rush out of the office to pick up the, the kids or anything. So um, we implemented flexible Fridays and we were careful, careful around our language. So we didn't say, hey, you have a day off every Friday. It was more like, you know, you have the flexibility to choose your work schedule, how you how you see fit. So if you've gotten all your work done during the other four days and there's nothing you need to focus on on, on Friday, then then OK, just take care of yourself. You know, it's kind of a mental health. Um, if you um, you know still have work to do, which most of us do, you know, maybe don't schedule meetings on Fridays. Just have a, um, a slower paced day to help you get your work done that you haven't been able to get done during the week. So, you know, people really appreciated the flexible Fridays and the 11 to one ban on yeah. meetings. And just, I think overall, um, coming from HR that, that leadership cares, leadership understands and leadership cares about the well being um, of each of our employees. Um, so, I would say, Matthew, that those are kind of the the highlights as as to what we've yeah. done. No, that's that's great. I really I really like that that idea of just expressing gratitude, right? It doesn't it doesn't cost a lot to just express gratitude. Right. Sometimes yeah. that makes all the difference. Um, and if I could ban meetings from eight to five, I mean, that's that would <laughs> yeah. be my uh, policy. Right. <laughs> but uh, no, I like that idea as well. Um, Let's shift uh, a little bit to to another topic area. And I know the, the pandemic has really forced, you know, a lot of ways that we work and deliver services. And, and one of the biggest first impacts, it, will, it really shined a spotlight on our technology and maybe how good it was or wasn't um, and how that could hinder the execution of the organization's mission. So let's launch the next polling question, Danny, and just uh, get everybody's opinion on this. Was your organization's technology Sufficient to adapt to the technologies presented by the pandemic. And we've got yes, it was, no, or yes, it was sufficient, but it still presented challenges. Um, no, it's insufficient, but we quickly figured out a way to adapt. Or uh, no, it was insufficient, and we're still trying to figure it out. We're still kind of adapting to things. So we'll give people a little extra time. We just launched that, but people are answering it pretty quickly here. We got about 90% in. 
And I'll try out one of my dad jokes on you three while the rest of the poll is coming in. So, um, you know, during the pandemic, I tried to organize a professional hide and seek tournament, but it just didn't work out. Turns out that good players are really hard to find. Get it? They're really good at hiding. Uh -huh. That's yeah. great. So that was one of my great <laughs> jokes. So I think we've got 95% in. So go ahead and launch that uh, poll result, Danny. And here we go. So about a third of folks uh, said they got by, that it was sufficient. Uh, others sufficient, but still presented challenges. And, you know, luckily here, the, the minority, really about, you know, 26% uh, or so, say that their technology was insufficient. So um, let's talk about this a little bit. And, and Kristen, since we left off with you, maybe we'll start with you on this one and just see, you know, how did United Way uh, adapt to, to the use of technology to, to respond to the pandemic? You know, is there any new things that you used or, or did you have to rapidly adapt existing technology? Yeah, I, I would say we were in the the camp of the, uh, between the first and the second, you know, uh, poll answers. You know, we were, we really were prepared um, for this uh, un unknowingly, right? Um, we use Microsoft Teams as an organization. And prior to the pandemic, we were, encouraging the use of teams for uh, for just really creating teams, right? But also file sharing, et cetera. We hadn't been utilizing it much for actual meetings um, until you know, mid-March when we went 100% virtual. So at that point in time, Teams became the place to schedule all of our internal and external meetings. But I would say for 98% of our staff, um, you know, the 98% were, were already comfortable with Teams. So that was a very easy transition. For the two percent that weren't, we, you know, had some training and some handholding, um, and, and some of those people actually ended up being in finance who just really hadn't had to use Teams before. Uh, so we we did the necessary training for those handful of folks, um, but then everyone kind of was on board with Teams, and you know everything has really been running uh, pretty smoothly. Um, you know, for some of our external meetings, uh, Teams is hasn't always worked and so we have added zoom in to our uh, structure and a handful of people in the organization have the full zoom license where they can you know host a meeting without a time limit um, so we've added that in uh, and and that's really for those those meeting organizers that that kind of handle and schedule a lot of, of external meetings um, but we've also added in um, the zoom I guess, I don't know what the word is here, phone technology. Um, so we have uh, gotten rid of our uh, desk phones in the office since we're not there and it kind of seemed like a waste of money. Um, and we're utilizing Zoom for actual you know, phone calls. So when someone calls my office number now, um, it's there's no phone, physical phone to actually for it to ring to. Um, so it'll ring to my cell phone or my laptop or in Teams, depending on what settings I've set up. So that's kind of a neat feature that we've recently implemented. Um, and I would recommend it. It's, it is saving us money um, from a finance standpoint. Um, and and it, it makes us more agile. So whether we're going to continue to be remote, you know, post-COVID, whenever that, that time frame is, uh, whether we continue to be remote on some, some uh, form or fashion, or whether we're actually in the office physically, it really doesn't matter um, because we can be reached. So that's kind of some of the stuff we've been doing. Um, we also had to transition, I think Alyssa, you mentioned this, you know, the signing of documents. So we had begun using DocuSign uh, officially for some grant agreements, a lot of what we sign are grant agreements and contracts. Um, but we basically had to go, you know, full full scale on the, on the DocuSign process. But that's been amazingly smooth um, and easy. And I actually love DocuSign and I can sign into my uh, own DocuSign account now and um, just see what all I've uh, signed. So. We've, we've transitioned to that. And then, you know, the other thing that was kind of a little bit of quirky was, you know, how are, we, how are employees going to submit invoices for payment? Um, you know, that used to be, you know, I hate to admit it, but it used to be a paper process uh, where, where they would drop off the uh, kind of check request, invoice backup documentation, et cetera, to our AP person and finance, and then she would process checks or EFTs. So we moved all of that online. So same kind of submittal process, but it was all saved as a as one PDF file that would all be sent through to our uh, AP person, and she would process 
checks or EFTs, you know, that way. Um, we also transitioned as many vendors as possible to EFTs. So we sent out EFT forms, you know, anytime we mailed out a check, but, you know, we used email you know, for contacts and email vendors and had to fill out the EFT forms as well because we wanted to issue as few, you know, physical checks as possible. Um, number one, our AP person's not in the office much anymore um, right now. And, um, you know, people aren't in the office either, so they can't receive the check. So the easiest way for, for cash to transact w w was the EFT process. So, and we kind of, you know, added that in as well. Um, but Matthew, I would say that's, that's kind of what we've done to, to help with the technology situation. Yeah, and it's, you know, electronic signing of documents has been a long, a long time, but it took kind of this pandemic for a lot of people to go full, full bore on, right. yeah. uh, on doing that. And I know some organizations are even, they're really getting inventive with Microsoft Teams and they're using it for uh, workflows and, and, you know, routing approvals for invoices and all sorts of stuff that I didn't even know you could really do with Microsoft Teams. So I know a lot of people are just hitting the tip of the iceberg is figuring out some of the functionality and, and capability of some of this. Um, yeah, Phyllis, Teams I, is I was, great. We do love it. Yeah. Yeah. Phyllis, I was wondering on the education side with kind of delivery of, of education, um, you know, how, how has technology affected you guys? Is there is there anything that you've, any problems that you've had to solve using technology? Yeah, um, well, fortunately, from an operational side, we pretty much have already had our AP system be virtually all um, web-based. Our billing system is all web-based. Our payments are ACH or credit card. You know, you still have a few of those that come in by mail, but we, we, we really have not, from an operational side, um, missed a beat in terms of being able to deliver well that we were in person and we were out really um, offices were out through August even though um, we could return for programs in June so um, really did not miss a beat there everything was very effective we were using DocuSign I think we're in our fifth or sixth year for our um, for lots of things we had enrollment contracts already online so really um, didn't miss a beat there our biggest challenge was naturally um, having to go overnight to a remote learning environment and making sure our students had their materials, their technology, whether they could afford it or not. Um, and so we provided all of the technology. We had pickup days for kids. We, um, if they did not have internet access, um, whether it was um, a financing issue or whether it was because of where they lived and we have some remote areas that just don't have it, we provided hotspots and um, and we made sure our teachers were equipped to deliver so um, from their homes. So we did buy Zoom, even though it was free, you know, everybody was taking the free licenses. We wanted to make sure everybody had an account that we were in the hopper first if there were any issues. So we, um, we really have had no issues whatsoever pivoting to that. I think our biggest issues are really, um, if you'll remember, Zoom had some security issues. And when you're dealing with minors, that was of concern for us. So we had to put in a lot of extra steps to make sure we didn't have people jumping in on classrooms that weren't supposed to be in there. Um, so we had to add extra layers of security. And then also um, cyber, as you all know, is of greater risk right now. There was a, um, a third party breach that did affect probably many of us on this call with Blackboard. Um, and a heightened awareness that while everybody is using technology for every aspect of your business, um, we have really definitely been more focused on cyber. Um, we always did, you know, um, kind of uh, tests for phishing and um, kind of tried to set up our employees to get caught with Amazon gift cards and stuff like that. Um, it was always a scam just to make sure we remind people not to click the link. Um, because when you're doing all this other stuff, you forget to do that. So it was really important as we became more and more dependent on web-based systems and using um, our computers and sometimes in an unsecure environment in our homes, we wanted to make sure we didn't forget best practice and remind our folks, students and faculty and staff alike, to be very, very cognizant of cyber attacks. So we continue to, because this is not going away, to stay focused on that. But that I think is probably our biggest risk. Um, that and anything that happens with Zoom, um, you know, in terms of uh, like yesterday's Google down for two hours or what have you. But yeah, um, yeah. so um, no, but we've been, um, 
luckily we were in a position over years to be very well suited um, to handle this, both operationally and for a product delivery perspective. That's great. And uh, yeah, I totally agree. Cyber risks are not going away and we certainly created more of them than we resolved during the, the adaption uh, to, to this pandemic. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the next topic just because of time. And uh, let's launch the next polling question, uh, Danny, and see that. So how's your revenue been impacted for your organizations? Have you had significant reductions, some reductions, revenue neutral, or has revenue actually maybe increased over the uh, course of this pandemic for you? Uh, you know, according to a poll by independentsector.org, 53% of large and mid-sized not-for-profit organizations reported a reduction in individual giving while 83% experienced some sort of reduction in overall revenue as a result of COVID-19. So we wanna see just how, um, how those polling results by independent sector align up with the, with the audience view here. And it looks like we've got oh, about 87% of you that have uh, voted in on this so far. So if you were turned away from your screen, this would be a good time to come back and click on one of these real quick. We'll give it five more seconds just to get people's answers in. And we're doing pretty good. We're just about at 95%. So we'll close that out. And um, it looks like about uh, a quarter of folks, significant revenue uh, disruptions from COVID, about 41% with uh, some sort of revenue reduction, 20% neutral, about 20% or so. Uh, revenues have actually increased. So as far as um, the alignment, uh, it's pretty close. I think maybe our organizations fared a little bit better than those uh, surveyed in the polls. So let's talk about this a little bit. And Alyssa, since we haven't heard from you, you know what what impact has you know the, the revenue issue had on Foundation for the Carolinas, and and how have you had to adapt to changing funding situations? Sure. Um, so we, we like Kristen in the United Way, um, own our own building and host a variety of events throughout the year from, you know, corporate meetings to weddings on the weekends. And, um, so obviously with the shutdown in mid-March, uh, that, that was a pretty significant hit to our revenue stream. Um, we were not only canceling all of the events for 2020 that we had scheduled for the uh, remainder of the year, but we were also slated to do uh, a quite a bit of hosting for the RNC, um, which was additional revenue that had been budgeted and, and didn't come to fruition. Um, on top of that, our, our fund management is really market driven. Um, it's asset based fees for the most part. And so when the market took a huge hit in March as the pandemic was really kicking into gear, um, there certainly was some some nervous folks um, throughout the community foundation uh, worried about what was going to happen for the rest of the year and how our revenues would rebound. Um, we obviously, as most nonprofits are, are very people-driven, um, service-driven, and so nervous as to how those revenue drops would impact our ability to still serve the um, the needs of our donors and our clients. Um, but uh, on the flip side, we actually had um, some one-time pandemic-related things that came our way that really have, have driven uh, revenue up um, in the long run. And um, we have a significant portion of business that is related to employee relief funds. And as you can imagine, um, there's a lot of need for employee relief. So the volume there has been just astronomical. And we charge those um, that activity on a transactional base uh, system. So it's not asset driven. And so we were able to obviously make up on the asset or make up the drop in the asset base side uh, on the transactional side. In addition, the city of Charlotte, and I've seen this across the country uh, at various community foundations that with their local cities, um, received significant amounts of CARE uh, Act money and looked to their community foundations 
for help in getting that money out to their um, constituencies. And so we, uh, as an organization, took on a, a good bit of grant making, uh, program design, uh, et cetera, which in turn drove some revenues for us as well. So we feel good about where we're going to end up. Um, for the year, but certainly had some nervous time uh, in the middle of March and into the first part of April. Yeah, and and Kristen, I'm curious too. You mentioned one of the best best years uh, revenue wise. So, what challenges you know did that bring to you guys? Yeah, they you know the the COVID nineteen response and recovery fund. So we launched that literally you know the weekend. Of, of you know March 13, 14, 15, um, in conjunction with Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta. So we reacted and responded very quickly to create that fund, um, you know, and then jointly, you know, made foundation ask, et cetera, uh, to do the fundraising because you know most of it was was you know private foundation um, giving. You know, obviously individuals gave to the fund as well, but. The, you know, the staff ramp up to uh, put together volunteer committees to review um, uh, grant applications uh, for the fund, uh, for those, to re for those uh, grantees to receive the fund dollars. And that was pretty labor intensive. Um, we've had cycles of funding as well. So cycle one, cycle two, cycle three. Um, so the, the, it, the staff time, you know, on the fund went up drastically and and that's what what kind of what I was talking about earlier in terms of people and culture you know people you know are working so hard on doing this great work you know that they're also exhausted um so it's a little bit of a balance but we you know did have to you know pivot specifically our um kind of uh, community engagement team that works on the grants and proposals um and also you know pivot in finance to to get EFTs out, you know, timely for these grant cycles. So uh, it was our, you know, highest revenue year, um, but it, it also required a lot of, you know, in, intensive staff time. Yeah, I, I think we're all looking for a chance to unplug here over the next couple of weeks and in, in late December. I hope we all get a chance to do that. Yes, absolutely. Certainly for your folks as well. Um, let's launch our last polling question. We have about three or four minutes left here. Um, and just want to get people's perspective. What's your outlook for 2021 for your organization? And maybe while people are answering that, you know, um, let's get our panelists' thoughts. I guess, you know, what what are you thinking about going into the new year? Do you have a top concern or kind of a unforeseen risk on the horizon? Uh, Phyllis, how about how about you? Yeah. So um, who knows? Um, I think people think the vaccine will will certainly make normalcy a little bit more um, likely in the coming year. I think for us um, as a school with young children who may or may not have a vaccine, I think that challenge is still a real one. So as we look into the year, we are still preparing for both another year like this one with pandemic um, mitigation in place. We're also uh, thinking that maybe it would just be one semester, you know, through the fall uh, until uh, we can operate what will be the new normal or, um, or you know, all things perfect, uh, back to normalcy. I do think, um, you know, I think I read uh, when 9-11 happened, it took two years before people trusted in traveling again. I don't know that we'll see that again. Um, and you know, so many of our programs depend on travel. I do think we've learned a lot from this as um, I think one of the panels mentioned. People can work very effectively at home. Obviously, when we're selling a product that is very much people oriented, relationships on campus matter. But from a back office or operational perspective, that's probably something we can do more of. And I also think, um, you know, we made a big policy change. We're only going to have one snow day a year, whether it snows um, a lot or not, because we can operate remotely, but we want to give everybody one day to have fun in the snow. Mm -hmm. So that will change us forever, um, where, you know, we might have been out of school for a week if we had a bad snow in Richmond. So, um, you know, we will definitely make permanent changes. Mm -hmm. Professional development, look how many people can take a conference at the same time. Um, without an, a major expense. So uh, I think these things will become part of our permanent future. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll stop there and let somebody else respond. But yeah, I think um, here's where 
a crisis or this pandemic has provided some opportunity as well. Great, great. As a, as a boy growing up in Wisconsin, I loved a good snow day. So I'm glad yeah. you're keeping at least one of those open. <laughs> and we're leaving the poll. We're giving you extra time to respond to this poll question. So if you didn't see that there's a poll, it is up right now and you can still respond. Um, but maybe, uh, uh, Alyssa, your thoughts on the future? Yeah, um, you know, we're we're optimistic about next year. Obviously, we we are curious with where the market is going to um, bottom out because it, certainly we, we don't understand how it's sustaining, what it is sustaining now. And so we worry about um, a, another drop in the market and then um, kind of the, the the fatigue on these one-time things uh, that have have bolstered us this year um, going away, and so then we really will see you know, some impact from that drop in in uh, market value. Um, but I think that um, like those, we will see some permanent changes come out of this, which I think will be good. I will tell you that um, it was we did not we did not have any sort of a work at home policy before this i think it is um almost 100 percent guaranteed that there will be a policy that comes out of this um, because we have proven that it can be done and it can be done effectively and so uh, the more options you can give uh, staff to work and meet their needs uh, i think that is something that is going to be good that comes out of this so that's great and, and Kristen, we'll let you have the final say here before we uh, launch the results and see what just how how optimistic the, the audience is. Yeah, um, so we are, I would say, cautiously optimistic uh, about the next, you know, 12 to 18 months. Our traditional, you know, revenue streams, you know, have been declining um, and we budgeted for an appropriate level of decline. Um, but the non-traditional revenue streams, such as the, the COVID-19 response and recovery fund, we also launched a, you know, launched a uh, United for Racial Equity and Healing Fund, and we were also managing $22 million in CARES Act funds through the city of Atlanta. So all of those things, you know, are great, and they've helped us pivot. Um, some of the pivoting has been done to us, and we have done some of the pivoting. Um, but I think our challenge is, you know, how do we continue to sustain our budget um, with all of these funding streams um, and, and, and people in, in government agencies that don't want to pay for your services? So, you know, yes, we want to give you $10 million, $20 million to do X, Y, Z, but you want to take 10% of that for your fundraising and administrative costs? Well, we don't want you to do that. You know, so I think that's one of our biggest challenges is how do we continue to fund operations when the gifts that, that come in are designated uh, in, in nature and the donor um, isn't excited about carving any of it away for the administration uh, of the grant. Um, so I will stop with that. I oh, appreciate that. And uh, Danny, if you want to launch our poll results, we'll see the results of the last poll. Overall, uh, let's see here, about 69% or so are either somewhat or very positive uh, about 2021. So that's good to see 20% neutral and just about 12% are either negative or, or someone's look, outlook is very bad for next year. But um, that's, I think, overall, some pretty positive outlooks for us. And, you know, as we wrap up here, I just, again, sorry that we could not get our video up for this session. Uh, I would have liked to have uh, all the panelists uh, visible, but um, Alyssa, Kristen, and Phyllis, thank you so much for joining us and really, really have appreciated your insights and uh, everything that your organizations have done, you know, over the last nine months and will continue to do going into the new year. So thank you to you and uh, happy holidays to you and your, your staff and your families. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you, thank Matthew. You. Great. Well, that will wrap this session. Just as a reminder, uh, you'll need to log out of this go to meeting session. We will try to get video back up and working for the next session, uh, which will uh, begin at, uh, what is the time? At uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time. So you got a little time for lunch here, and then we'll see you again this afternoon. Thank you, everyone.